And I'm glad to be back and glad to see a lot of people have joined into this meeting. I think it's a very important one. It has to deal with air ventilation and making sure that the air we breathe is as safe as it can be. Dr. Ed Nardell is here today, and we were very lucky to have him speak before our group a year ago regarding the importance of ventilation, and he is going to give us an update. Dr. Nardell is Professor of Medicine, Harvard Medical School, Division of Global Health Equity, Brigham and Women's Hospital, and Harvard School of Public Health, Department of Environmental Health. His research has focused on tuberculosis control, especially TB prevention and air disinfection. Since the COVID-19 pandemic began, he has focused on airborne transmission control for viral pandemics. Tonight, he will make the case that germicidal UV is the essential technology for disinfecting air in rooms where transmission is occurring. So at this time, let me turn the program over to Dr. Nardell. Thanks very much, Kevin. So I am going to focus on schools, particularly, and also and on a particular modality of air disinfection, not because I have a vested interest in germicidal UV, although I've consulted for some companies, but because for the last 30 years I have worked in air disinfection and I'll show you that it has some distinct advantages over any other modality that we can use easily in a large setting like a school. So what you see on this first slide is in fact an upper room UV fixture up on a wall, sort of a kind we've been using for many decades, and just a picture of the UV spectrum. This is not new technology. Here's a 1946 monograph on the applications of germal, aerothermal, and infrared energy by Matthew Lukash, 1946. I wasn't even born yet. But more than 75 years later, the application of upper room germicidal uh, UV, although I will argue is essential, is not standard practice. A lot of engineers don't know about it. There's a lot of what we would now call fake news about it, or really poor information. And so as a result, it isn't standard. It's changing rapidly. I was just on a call today, a Zoom call today, with multiple participants from the Department of Energy. Lots and lots of companies are making uh, germicidal fixtures that never had any interest, and it was just tuberculosis we were dealing with. But the pandemic has put germicidal UV on the map because people quickly learn that there's nothing that can do what upper room germicidal UV can do or whole room UV when we get to that. So this is probably the only really excellent epidemiologic study that has been done about air disinfection resulting in less transmission of a highly infectious virus in schools that there is. And it was done in the 1930s and published in 1942 by William Firth Wells. And it was from measles. Measles is the most infectious virus there is. Of course, this was before there was measles vaccine. So every few years in winter, there would come through essentially epidemics, pandemics of measles. And in schools, the younger kids were expected to get much more infection because they hadn't had exposure before. And the upper classes, Many of them had been exposed in prior years, and so they were somewhat immune, and you'd expect less. So in this very well done study, and very well written up study, they chose two schools outside of Philadelphia, in Germantown and, and Swarthmore, and they put the UV in the lower classes where they expected more measles, and the controls were in the upper classes, unirradiated rooms. And I'll show you what the setup actually looked like and you see the result, essentially month by month, actually it's more than month by month, it's every two weeks, you see the numbers of cases in the upper classes and the lower classes. Now, I said this is the only good study because these studies are extremely difficult to do. In fact, a similar study was attempted in upstate New York and it didn't show a profound effect. 
not because the technology didn't work. As far as I know, the technology worked just as well as it did here. But the kids rode home from rural school on a school bus. And kids that didn't get infected in school were exposed in the school bus. In urban London, it was also attempted and again didn't show the dramatic effects that they showed in Pennsylvania. And in that case, kids went home and played together in crowded tenements. So the message is, and it's really an important one, is that if you're going to do an intervention to prevent an airborne infection, you really have to know where transmission's occurring and cover those areas well. If it's in school buses as well as schools, you have to do something on school buses as well. Swarthmore and Germantown were fairly affluent suburbs of Philadelphia. Kids were dropped off and picked up and they didn't have that problem that they saw in upstate New York and also in London. I'm aware of two more studies now being done around COVID and germicidal UV, and I fear that we're gonna have another upstate New York and or urban study because no one is paying attention to what happens to the kids once they leave the school. If they're going to play together or have encounter each other, or if it's in a school where the kids share the cafeteria at lunchtime and some are coming from irradiated classes and others from not, we're not gonna see the same effect. You have to know where transmission's occurring and that'll come up again. So this is what the classroom actually looked like in Swarthmore Public Schools on the left side. See some upper room fixtures here. They had high ceilings, so they're very simple fixtures. See the kids in fairly crowded, close to each other, and that's what it looked like. Here we see a, a modern UV fixture on a wall in, a, in another classroom. And so the technology has not changed much, and nor does the application of this particular technology. Now, up until now, we've used UV in clinics and hospitals and homeless shelters, and mostly it was around tuberculosis. And that's one of the reasons why there has been relatively little progress in the, developing the technology. Tuberculosis in non-COVID times is the number one infectious killer of adults in the world, still today, in non-COVID times. So in 2019, the tuberculosis FAR was much more than any viral infection or any other infection, but nobody cared in terms of developing technology. But now suddenly with COVID, there's a great deal of attention paid to developing LED UV and other technology advancements. There's another phenomenon going on where UV I think will have an important role as global warming is occurring, more and more air conditioners are being sold. And I've updated this slide. This is an older one, but basically you see steep rise in sales of air conditioning in India. In India, the way you, you um, disinfect air essentially is by opening the window. But as soon as you turn on an air conditioner, you close the window. So we're gonna see, I think, a real steep climb increase in airborne infections as more and more air conditioners are required to prevent heat-related morbidity and also because of air pollution and we need to do something and to me the solution is upper room germicidal UV because ventilation under conditions where there's air pollution or extremely hot temperatures is not a feasible solution. Room air cleaners is the other one and we'll talk more about that. And this is what happens when you close the window and turn on the air conditioner. This is in an office in Cape Town, South Africa, five people in an office building, the window open, CO2 levels, we were talking about them earlier, rose from sort of outdoor levels of 500 to about 800 or so. And then uh, the people leave and the window stays open and they go back to normal. Then they close the window and turn on the air conditioner. And of course, the air conditioning is not contributing CO2. The people came back in. They're contributing the CO2, but the windows are closed. That's all that the air conditioner is playing a role here. It's just that in order for an air conditioner to be efficient, you have to close the windows. And you see the steep rise in CO2 to 1,500, 2,000 in a room with just five people in it with the window closed. So that is increasing the risk of transmission if there is an infectious source in that room because what we call the rebreathed air fraction, how much air you breathe has been exhaled by somebody else, that's what the CO2 is telling you. So CO2 can be used as a marker 
of risk of airborne infection given a source. And upper room UV, I think, may be the way to deal with this global warming problem and air conditioner use. Now, again, if you have to do air disinfection beyond what is acceptable for comfort, the uh, ventilation is built for comfort, there are three options. More ventilation, and that's expensive because you have to heat or cool the air that you're bringing in from the outside. So natural ventilation, open the windows, mechanical ventilation, more of it. Room air cleaners, like the one that's depicted here on the slide uh, in the upper room, it looks like a, some sort of an air moving device and, and in fact contains either filters or UV, but it's moving air through the device and cleaning it. And it, it does a good job at that. And manufacturers will show you that contaminated air goes in one end and what comes out is free of bacteria or viruses. That's not the problem, as you'll see. And then there's germicidal UV, and I've shown you a, a close-up of a fixture here with the UV lamp behind a number of louvers. There's also a new kind of UV called whole room 222 nanometer UV, which is coming on board. It's not widely available and, and rather expensive, but it's getting cheaper and probably is going to be the future of UV eventually is this whole room UV. Now, there's a limitation to all disinfection strategies, and that is that, and we're going to talk about ventilation, but it applies to everything. When you move air through a room, we can quantify that as room air changes. So we say when the volume of a room has entered and left, that was one air change. Now, of course, when you put a certain amount of air in a room and remove it, it's not like a piston. Some of the air goes in, mixes with the air that's in the room, and what comes out is a mixture of new air and old air. So, in fact, what you remove with one air change under well-mixed conditions is 63% of the contamination in that air. A second room air change removes 63% of what's left, and a third air change removes 63% of what's left. So you're always removing the same percentage, but of a lower and lower concentration so that the incremental decrease is very, very small as depicted on this curve here where you, you increase ventilation and you're getting less and less risk, but at a higher and higher cost for that increased ventilation and the incremental improvement with each air change is not uh, linear. It follows this asymptotic curve. It is possible to equate ventilation to the effects of other air cleaning technologies, including room air cleaners and upper room UV. When UV has inactivated 63% of the infectious organisms in a room, we say that's the equivalent of one air change. So that should be pretty clear. The second air change has the same problem. You're always, in this case, inactivating the same percentage, but of a lower concentration so that it makes a smaller and smaller difference. The difference is that while it's very expensive to add more and more ventilation of outdoor air, it isn't that expensive to add more UV air disinfection, as you'll see. So the concept is shown here, hospital bed, but what you have is a fixture in the wall generating a zone of UV above people's heads from a fixture. Let's say the upper two feet and the remaining seven feet, the lower room is virtually UV free. Air in the room moves normally upward due to body heat and motion, but warm contaminated air rises up to the upper room, cool disinfected air comes down, and although this motion of the air is almost imperceptible, it is imperceptible, the effect is much greater than virtually any other method of air disinfection. If you want to really increase the rates of air mixing between the upper and lower room, you can add a ceiling fan, which fits into some environments and not into others, but it assures that there's no problem with air mixing. So how does it compare? This slide looks at the relative effectiveness 
of various air disinfection technologies. And the study was done in Russia by a good friend of mine, Grigory Volchenkov, a doctor in Vladimir, Russia, and Paul Jensen, who is a engineer and a PhD microbiologist who worked with Grigory on this project. And what they did is they were renovating a hospital floor. They took one room before the ward was open and they aerosolized various test organisms in that room. And they used three different air cleaners, ventilation and UV and compared the effectiveness of removing infectious particles from that room and also the cost of doing that. And you see the operating cost per year of one equivalent air change. So by the way, the three air cleaners are this one here, Potuck, Tree 100 and Aerolife. These are brands I don't think exist anymore. Certainly the Potuck was a, a device created for the Soyuz space capsule. And so it was considered like the ultimate most expensive device. And we thought we would try the most expensive device and had access to it but no one would seriously buy such a device for use in a uh, office or something or hospital, but we used it. That's why it's so expensive. But the cost per air change is depicted here and you see by far the least expensive cost per air change is upper room UVGI compared to either increased ventilation, which has to be heated or cooled and or these three air cleaners, which are pushing air through filters and may require quite a few of them. These were simple upper room devices depicted here made in Russia. We have more efficient ones now. If you looked at the relative economical efficiency is what Grigory called it, and you call ventilation one, then UV was 9.4 times more cost effective as a way to disinfect air than any of the air cleaners or ventilation. This is not published, although I've published these two slides as results in, in a few papers that can be located. I was in Pretoria giving a talk in South Africa in 2016, and a vendor of room air cleaners was there and touting that this was the latest and greatest way to remove contaminants from rooms from TB they were focused on and we inquired what is the airflow through that device what is the clean air delivery rate how much air comes through the filter and since virtually all infectious particles are removed by a HEPA filter or a MERV 13 filter we could talk about just what the airflow is through the device and that was 28.3 liters per second or 60 cfm cubic feet per minute which in a hypothetical room of four meters by four meters by three meters high would be 2.1 air changes. Better than nothing if you have very, very poor ventilation. You could be doubling ventilation if it was very, very bad, but not that great as CDC recommends six to 12 air changes per hour for rooms and hospitals where infectious patients are kept or procedures are done. If we put upper room UV in that room with an average of 30 microwatts per centimeter squared in the upper room for TB, which is less sensitive than COVID, for example, with good air mixing, we would expect at least 20 air changes per hour. So 10 times as much air disinfection in that room with upper room UV compared to this room air cleaner, which the vendor was trying to sell. Now, how does UV work? It works by causing mutations in the viral nucleic acids, rendering them unable to replicate. So even though you might inhale a virus that's been irradiated, it would not be able to replicate in your cells and therefore it would not cause COVID or flu or whatever the virus is. Now, what we mentioned earlier, where is the transmission occurring? Is it in the school classroom or is it on the school bus? Well, another place that it could be happening or being transmitted through is the ventilation system. And you'll probably know that there's been a big movement, including strong recommendations from a colleague of mine at the Harvard School of Public Health, that the most important thing to do in schools is increase the ventilation. And one way to do that, they argue, is to put 
MERV 13 filters in the ventilation system. And my argument is this. I would like to see a good report of transmission between rooms where the people who got infected had no direct contact with the source. I would like to see a report of transmission between floors in a building where the infectious sources and those infected had no other contact except the air. I can't find any. Even on the ship outbreaks, etc., it was believed that transmission that occurred was from person to person contact. That doesn't mean it's not airborne. It means that you have to be at close proximity in the room or that this envelope virus, which is rather fragile in the environment, what I've depicted here on the right side, the green is supposed to be rooms and the yellow is supposed to be a delivery of air through the ventilation system and exhaust. And somehow if this individual coughs virus into the air and it's taken into the ventilation system and has to go through a fan uh, and through even a coarse filter and then come back, either by dilution or by disruption, it doesn't make it. So in my view, there is very little evidence of transmission of virus through ventilation systems. And if that is true, although filters do a lot of good things in getting out pollen and a variety of things, they may not be helping much or at all with COVID transmission in my view. Now, if you take a building ventilation system that's providing one air change of outside air and say two or three air changes of recirculated air, in theory, when you put in a filter, you've converted all that to the equivalent of outside air because you're filtering what comes back in and it doesn't contain any pathogen. And so someone would say, well, you've quadrupled or multiplied by five the equivalent air ventilation. My argument is you may actually have decreased the ventilation because of the resistance, but you haven't changed the risk of COVID because there was none coming through the ventilation system in the first place. So looking to the left, uh, in my view, the risk is in the room where the infectious source and the other occupants exist. And that again, you have three choices. You can increase total ventilation at a high cost. You can put in a room cleaner you can put in upper room UV. You notice I haven't mentioned bipolar ionization because I think the consensus is in the scientific community anyway that there's very little evidence that bipolar ionization disinfects air at a rate that is comparable to the other technologies we're talking about. So it has been sold and some people have invested in it as a solution, but probably not as proven effective as the other three things we're talking about here. There's been a lot of advances in the application of upper room germicidal UV. We have lots of proof of efficacy in a variety of settings, including mostly around other infections and COVID, but COVID is highly UV susceptible. We have a lot of evidence of safety. We have better dosing guidelines. We have looked at fixture performance. We basically LED fixtures, you'll see down the line. I had a meeting again with the Department of Energy today. It was all about LED UV because it's going to save a lot of money. And there are other ways of disinfecting air, including what's called far UV. So this is a paper that I published with colleagues from South Africa and the United States a number of years ago now, 2015, showing 80% efficacy against human-generated tuberculosis in a experimental hospital ward where all of the air was extracted from the ward and exposed hundreds of quite vulnerable guinea pigs, literally guinea pigs. You can see them in the two exposure chambers that are depicted here. And on every other day, the UV in the rooms with the patients was either on or off. On the days that the UV was on, the air went to one guinea pig colony, and on the days that the UV was off, it went to the other guinea pig colony. And after alternating back and forth, back and forth for a period of four months, we had essentially 80% less transmission to the guinea pigs who were receiving air only on days when the UV in the rooms was on. So this was as direct evidence as you can find 
that against tuberculosis, which is harder to inactivate than COVID virus, that upper room UV in a very practical, real world environment was highly effective in disinfecting air on that ward. In fact, it was the equivalent of adding 24 air changes in terms of the effectiveness of, of germicidal UV. So again, not new technology. The NIOSH has published basic upper room germicidal guidelines back in 2009. We've improved those guidelines, I think, now uh, over a decade later. And from that study, I just showed you dosing guidelines that say how much UV you need in a room to achieve what kind of results we had. And I, I show to people who are interested in doing this kind of thing, if you had a room, how you figure out the volume and you figure out how many fixtures you would need and where you would locate them. I won't go into those details here. Now, we also learned that all fixtures weren't the same. It turned out that two of the type fixtures we used in that experiment were 10 times less efficient than the other two the other type of fixture we used. And now we would not use a fixture without knowing exactly how much UV comes out of it and understanding its effectiveness. All these technologies look to be relatively inefficient, but only 6% of the energy that goes into that fixture comes out as effective UV, but it's plenty effective, as I've shown you, in terms of air disinfection. And the cost of these lamps are not high to operate from an electricity perspective. The lamp that is in a UV fixture is identical to a fluorescent light in your house. The only difference is that UV does not penetrate glass at all. So the fluorescent lamps in your house generate UVC, but it doesn't come out at all. What it does, it strikes the surface of the lamp on the inside, which is coated with a phosphor, which turns that UV energy into light and you use it for visible light. UV lamps are the same technology, but the glass is different. It's a vicor or quartz material that allows UV to escape. And then finally, as I've mentioned rapidly, mercury lamps that produce UV very effectively and, and cheaply are being rapidly replaced with LEDs, which have no mercury, eventually will have a long life, run on low current so it can be battery backup and have a great design potential. For example, on this slide, you see someone standing on a device with all these little LEDs, which are sterilizing the bottom of their shoes in an operating room setting. The wavelength is not exactly the same as mercury, and we need to work out some details on their application, but you can purchase LED UV fixtures now. There are other ways to use upper room UV, this is an idea that I had after looking at an airport and realizing that the ceiling w was hiding the pipes, it was actually quite porous. So in this case, we put a UV lamp on the wall up above an egg crate ceiling and put a fan above or below the egg crate to move the air through the ceiling and you block the UV from entering the room with the egg crate but it's even much more efficient in the upper room without any louvers in disinfecting the air. And we showed that and published that the equivalent air changes per hour were many times greater with this approach than with conventional UV fixtures, but it is a big undertaking. You have to buy a crate and replace your ceilings and not every place has the ceiling height for that. So fixtures still remain as the most popular way. This looks like Middle Eastern restaurant in Seattle has an egg crate ceiling and upper room germicidal UV above it. They chose to put the fans below the ceiling, but it is in use. So I think I'll stop there and take any questions you might have. Here is our first question. Can you explain how UV light can be safe when it is used in an open room as opposed to contained within a shielded box or used with ducts to funnel the air to a centralized system? Isn't there health risks and risks to the exposed skin? So first of all, UV is used in both ways. It can be used in air cleaners or in ventilation ducts without exposing people at all. And it can be used in the upper room where it is kept from exposing people in the lower room. That's why it's called upper room germicidal UV. The levels in the lower room are well below any exposure risk. And then with the newer 222 
UV, it is shown directly into the room with people there because UVC, this short wavelength UV, basically doesn't penetrate the outer dead layer of skin or even the, the newest level of 222, the lowest wavelength UV, doesn't even penetrate the tear layer on the eye to get to the cornea. But let's not talk about 222 at the moment, just because it adds a little bit too much to cover, uh, and it's not in wide use yet. But if we talk about using UV in the upper room versus in air cleaners or in ventilation ducts, there's a big, big difference, which I try to communicate, but it's, it's hard to get across. The difference is when I put it in the upper room, I'm irradiating a huge volume of air at one time. And the mixing of all of the air in the room through the upper room is highly efficient, even based on low velocity heat generated currents. And if you add a ceiling fan, it becomes that much more effective. If I put it in a box, I've got to get all of that air in the room through the box and irradiate it. And that's very difficult. You take a room air cleaner, and as I showed you in that example, where it would produce at most, set on high, produce two air changes per hour. So if I want to get the 20 air changes, I need 10 of them in the room. And you can imagine the noise. In my building where I'm sitting right now, my uh, condominium, we have a gym and the ceilings are rather low. So even though I would have liked to have suggested upper room germicidal UV, it wasn't possible for COVID precautions. So I recommended air cleaners and we bought some very high quality industrial air cleaners from a company that I've worked with in the past. And they produce the equivalent of six air changes per hour in the gymnasium. I'm glad it's not a classroom because even though these are high quality devices, they produce quite a bit of noise and drafts. Getting all of the air in the room through a box with a fan is a challenge. Getting it through the upper room in an occupied room is much, much more effective. UV, again, been working with it for a hundred years. There are very clear statements from the authorities indicating the UV is, is essentially not carcinogenic. It can't cause a real skin sunburn compared to outside sun, which is UVB and UVA, which is penetrating. UVC doesn't get past the outer dead layer of skins. So they say, well, what are the long-term effects? Well, you're always sloughing off the outer dead layer of skin. So anything that's irradiated in two days is gone. So there's no long-term effects of germicidal UV either. If we want to compare exposure if you're outside on a sunny day in a sunny part of the world or in the country, in a few hours, you can get something like 240 millijoules of exposure to UVA and B, which is penetrating and dangerous. The maximum level we allow in a room in a working day is six millijoules, and it's the non-penetrating variety. So there is a huge safety issue with germicidal UV. If you climb up on a ladder, however, and look into a germicidal fixture, you can get a photokeratitis from that direct exposure to 54 nanometer wavelength. You won't do it again. There is no long-term effects, but it could be quite painful. We don't expect people to climb up and look into the fixture. We're not worried about kids in the lower room. We're not worried about teachers in the lower room. We have monitored what people get in the lower room. And we can't, uh, even with poorly designed fixtures, we get maybe a third of the limit value that is official. So very safe and very effective and much more effective than room air cleaners. I do not see any more questions. Uh, Dr. Nardell, thank you very much for this very important and interesting presentation. We hope to have you back again in the near future.